So ladies and gentlemen, give them a very, very big warm welcome to our members of the Interactive Game, of course. Leading the way, passing on the game, it's Rob Jones, Dean Coppinger, David Sires, Chris Brown, Thomas Blair, and the manager, Randy Flynn. We are uh, in a uh, reminiscing mood, of course, about that fantastic day uh, down at Griffin Park all those years ago. There's so much uh, to cover, so many elements in which leading up to that game that we are going to cross tonight. We're also going to throw the uh, uh, floor open to questions as well during the course of the evening. And first of all, I'm uh, going to uh, turn to the uh, gentleman who, uh, shall we say, masterminded it. He was brought into the breach, of course with the uh, departure of the previous manager, Dean Saunders. Brian Flynn joins us tonight. Big round of applause for Brian, everyone. <laughs> Brian, lovely to see you once again tonight. A, a, a man of wonderful footballing pedigree. A man who's seen it all and done it all in football, but I'm sure you hadn't seen anything quite like that in the day. It was a truly magical day. I, I must admit, though, coming here tonight has been so warming to see the lads they obviously don't see each other you know, every day like they used to working day in day out so hard uh how special it still is to them as well you know coming back together to, to know uh, but my job was easy dean had done a good job obviously that's one of the reasons why he went rob had helped so much in the development of the team in terms of his strength and his leadership and that was uh, key to me taking over the job, especially the call that Steve Mitch. That really s sealed it for me. Once that went in, I thought, we've got a chance this year, and uh, thanks thankfully we took it. Yeah, it's, I mean, obviously when, when, you know, clubs change the managers and, you know, when, when the team is challenging at the right end of the league, it doesn't always happen that way, does it? A manager change usually happens when, you know, the club is struggling down at the bottom, but you were, you know, thrust into it. Because your position was director of football, wasn't it, Brian? Please say yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but well, when I, came, I, I, I had uh, uh, a big involvement. I came in the May. Uh, Dean invited me in the May and said, right, we've got 10 players on contract. We need another eight. So I had a, I had a big influence on the, the players who would come in as well so i knew the players that was that was going to come in and do the job so in that sense it was easier for me so i knew what the players were all about i'm just going to pass over to uh, to rob if i may because rob obviously you played a massive part in you know you were basically brian's right hand man weren't you, you were captain you were also you know class assistant manager uh, for that period of time i think we all played a massive part to be honest i think uh, the dressing room that we had was was such a yeah, probably the best dressing I've been in since I've been in my whole career. I've had players who've, who've been there done before, players who were desperate to do it again. Uh, we had this man again who was desperate to get Doncaster back in the championship. Uh, she'd never gone on that's for us, if you ask me. So, <laughs> 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 he, came, he came back, he came back and he played every game. Uh, and I, think, I said it earlier in the interview earlier, if he'd have been here the whole season, he wouldn't have gone down to last game because he's that much of an apparent influence on the whole group. Uh, I think he, he epitomised and showed us all as, as football what Doncaster will actually means to him and what it should mean to us. So the dressing room was, was easy because everybody was driven in the, in the same direction, with the same uh, attitude, the same, the same foresight. And I think it showed that on a, on a Saturday night, a Saturday when we played, we played as a group together. Uh, we played with passion, desire, determination. And uh, I think the majority of us wanted something to prove and had something to prove from the previous year. Obviously, I came to Sheffield Wednesday, told us good enough to play there. Uh, that these lots of the boys came down from the championship, the team was coming up the other way. So we all had something to prove in our own little way. And it was just a, it was just a great gesture to be in. Uh, camaraderie was fantastic. Uh, some of the stories that I can't tell you. But, uh, <laughs> no, it was great. And the prime, as I said earlier, uh, I know Dean left in Dean's way and Dean went on to his past as new, but Dean put all the, all the, <laughs> <laughs> Dean put all the, all the platform together. Uh, we never changed the style of how we played. Uh, everything was in the same structure, everything was the same way. And like Brian said, it was easy for all of us, easier for all of us, because uh, we knew what we were doing. Fantastic stuff. And 
Chris Brown, lovely to see you once again. Two spells with uh, the Rovers and um, you know decorated in success certainly with the uh, the second spell going up. How was what are your memories and recollections of that season and that day in particular? It was um, the season itself was split in two for me because me and Dean didn't really see eye to eye. Um, <laughs> well, just just you and Dean. <laughs> um, and it was how it came about me getting back in the team. I think on Dean's last game, I wasn't even in the squad. I wasn't even on the bench. And I think I've gone out on the Saturday night as a bit of a head loss, you know, I'm as you do. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I saw it on the Sky Sports, and obviously everybody's different, but I was delighted because I knew that, <laughs> I knew that it was only going to go, and, and credit to Billy, Billy Payton, because Billy was on fire. I think, did Billy score two? And then got sent off. Got to a crew. It was, was, that, was, was that yeah. yeah. It, it, um, the gaffer left by then, the team left. So that was me back in the team. Cheers, um, Robert. <laughs> um, so for the rest of the season then obviously I'm thankful for for these two for for bookkeepers in the team. because um, Billy was well within his rights to, to get back in after scoring two, you know. Um, but we just, I think, we just had that together, like they both said, that it was always gonna, we all just wanted the same thing, and we had such massive characters, you know, you, Neil Sullivan, uh, Jamie McCoo, you know, just leaders and winners that it was only ever gonna go one way. And I suppose with, you know, not a massive squad, was there, at the, at the club's disposal, it, you know, creates that togetherness and, and you get the right amount of characters, maybe not in quantity, but you get the right amount of quality characters in the dressing room, you know, it really does bode well for success. Yeah, definitely. I think Brian mentioned the, the signings at the beginning of the season, getting, getting Jonah and Jamie McComb in. Um, I think Dean actually said, I'm going to sign men. <laughs> we were just looking at him, like, who else is <laughs> I want effing men. <laughs> um, but yeah, every game, any, anything that came into the box, we, we, the rest of us were worried because we knew that, and that's why we had such a good defensive record. Um, yeah. Fantastic. David Sires, good to see you uh, once again and, uh, and still playing as well, which is uh, brilliant to hear. Now, your journey to Rovers. Uh, was obviously from Bradford City. I've got some Bradford City uh, fans who are uh, friends, weren't too happy about that particular transfer. But uh, how did that move come about to the football club and uh, how did you enjoy your time? The move, the move was a bit strange one actually. I was supposed to be going to Coventry, um, but they had the transfer invited at the time and they couldn't actually sign uh, anyone. And they put, they put a contract in place. And my dad was actually out for lunch with. Um, <coughs> sports lawyer who was friends with John Ryan and he was one of those like, oh, I'll, I'll mention it to I'll mention it to John like um, all right fine John mentioned it to Dean and Dean told me he brought me when I came down here um, showed me around the ground went and sat up in the office upstairs and he was like look this is what I did and he, he went on Y Scout which was the scouting thing and went and just started showing highlights of me playing like the previous couple of years and said yeah I like that I like that I like that that's why I signed it so <laughs> can, I, can I just say something? Dean Saunders absolutely loved Dave Sayers. It was embarrassing. Every manager has a blue eyed boy, don't they? I couldn't really play football, but he just wanted me to go and run around with headers and with tackles and get in the box, so that suited me as well. So. It's crackers, isn't it? Because, I mean. I've, I've, I've been a part of this football club for about 12 years now and on very, very few occasions has there ever been you know, a time where the squad hasn't been completely together. It's, it's always a good squad of lads to come into. I mean, the, ch the chap next to you who is still of this parish and hopefully still for a very, very long time to come, you know, just really epitomises the whole essence of the football club and it, it must make it so easy for players like yourselves to have come in, you know, and settle in. I was I was one of the few coming in from from sort of lower, lower level, and, and the team just got relegated. Not really sure what to you know what to expect. I think the one good thing is because there was only about eight players when I joined, because I didn't have to do I never had to do an initiation song because uh, <laughs> I left to actually sort of manage. And that's the great thing about the start of the season. Suddenly I'm playing with these lads who I've you know looked up to and seen over the few year, the last few years. And like I say, when you know, 
you're thinking on the pitch, maybe tired or, or you're struggling a bit. You, know, you, you look around at, at, at these lads in the team you were playing with, and as they helped you through, the same in the change room beforehand. There was never a lack of, of voices or anything like that, and it, it just it just helped carry you through. It was such a, a massive thing for me to be able to play with, you know, and, and helped me grow as a player. And I think the likes of say James Husband, the younger lads coming in, would have benefited from that as well. But, um, so it just had that that really good mix of especially unique with the experienced players that she just needs to get you through those those games and those moments. And did uh, did John Ryan get up an interview? Uh, an interview? Did he get an invite to your wedding in the? Uh... No, no, he didn't. But he got my he, he lent me his car. So I was like, John. Oh, that was right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I knew he was around it somehow. <laughs> I, mean, I think I asked for a new contract or his car for the wedding, and I got the car for the wedding. So uh... <laughs> I remember that as well because there was a little bit of it to do with that, wasn't there? Uh, There's something along those lines, anyway. But David, thank you for the moment. Tommy, 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 Tommy. Great to see you, fam. Lovely to see you. What a great player uh, Tommy was. We didn't have Tommy for long enough. Do you agree? We didn't have you for long enough, Tommy, but when we did have you, it was absolutely fantastic. How did you enjoy your time at the club? No, I loved it here. Um, I think I've said, now I've obviously finished playing that, Doncaster was probably my favourite place where, where I've played, I think. Especially that second season when obviously we got promoted, it was I'd say, the highlight of my career. So I've got nothing but sort of good things to say. And yeah. as with what happens in, in football, and it's uh, you know, footballers are lamented, oh, you know, they get well paid and this, that and the other. You're 32, you've had to stop doing something you absolutely love, regardless whether you get paid for it or not. Because basically, you've, you've got to make sure you can walk about and, and look after your kids after, after football. Yes, yeah, like I say, it's a disappointing, but life goes on and I've got the hip of a 70 year old. So. Fantastic, it's just what we always wanted, didn't it? <laughs> One thing with Tommy Spur, ladies and gentlemen, he will always, always smile. Fantastic. Tommy, we're going to come back to you in a short while. James, great to see you. Ivan, okay. Um, was it all about you that day, in the end? Was it all about you? Definitely wasn't. Um, I think Rob massively does himself an injustice because he was probably the single best performance throughout the season I've ever seen. Um, to go from captain to assistant Brian um, to basically dragging everybody along with him every single day. Um, yeah, it was inspirational. I mean, coming back from Nottingham Forest in the January, I, I straight away I knew that the group were geared up for promotion. The, the drive and determination from every single player, um, obviously led by Rob, was, was evident. Especially being at a club where that wasn't so. Um, a lot of lads that sort of came in, trained and then got off as quick as they could at Nottingham Forest. Um, and it was the opposite at Doncaster when I came back. It was mm -hmm. lads in the gym, lads doing extra on the training pitch, shooting, um, defending, all the rest of it. And I knew straight away that if you had a chance. I mean, you've, you've been through it and seen it all, this football club, you lived through the experiment, didn't you? You saw all sorts of uh, things that would uh, go off there and players fly, flying in for a game on a Friday and then straight out of the country again straight after. So, at the end of the day, you know, to come back into a nice, settled, balanced squad and, and with a winning mentality as well. I think it's, I think, again, it's the, one of the most difficult things to do is to get relegated and then get promoted the next season. Um, I've been fortunate enough to do it twice from League 2 to League 1 a couple of seasons ago and then obviously this season but again it never looked good at the start of the season, a lot of players went, we didn't have many players as Dave, as Dave said and, um, but we signed well, we signed David Cottrell who, who had to prove a point with most assists, his set pieces were unbelievable and um, we got momentum, I think we got momentum early doors and we carried it on into the new year over the Christmas period like I say, when I came back, I like to think that I give, give the lads a little bit of a lift. Um, and like Brownie said, the second half of the season was, was unreal. Um, I remember going into games thinking, like, if you keep spelling like this, if you, if you get a move, which you did. Um, but yeah, it was never in doubt. I think, obviously, going into that Brentford game was, it was unlike any other, really, sort of, knowing that all, 45 games before it were, were down this one game, it was, 
I was going to say, can you, sorry for breaking off, can you encapsulate the, the mindset then going down, you, you're going onto a football field to play a, a game of football that, that, that you've done most of your adult life, and but the, the significance and importance of it, how does that weigh on your shoulders in particular, because it weigh, obviously it's a responsibility for all the fans that have gone down, the, the, the town of Doncaster as well. Yeah, I think I had room with Dean Firmer at the time, um, so I got a good night's sleep. <laughs> um, was, yeah, and I, and I remember saying to him, look, tomorrow when you write yourself in the folklore, it's, it's that important to, to people at Doncaster and, and to the lads, and it's one of them games that, that sets you up for the rest of your career, and um, I remember going into the game feeling, feeling anxious more than anything, um, and the longer the game went nil-nil, you, you're even more anxious because you know that the longer it goes, there's one opportunity that could make it or break it for us. Um, obviously the rest is history, but I think it becomes a blur on the day, but looking back, people say try and enjoy it, but I don't think you could enjoy it, if I'm being honest. No, and, and, and couple that with Rob, I'm going to get a come to you now if I may. So, turn that on its head, what's the difference in the pressure then, if it's a game, sorry, if it's a game to stay in the league, instead of going up, is there any difference in pressure or is the pressure still the same actually going for the league or actually trying to stay in it? I don't know, I don't know that pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I think uh, going back to the, the, the Brentford game, uh, that's probably the most confident I've been in on the football which in my entire life. Uh, we've done a week where we prepared meticulously about what Brentford would do, what Brentford would bring, but more importantly what we would do and what we would bring. Uh, I could have killed Jamie McCoo when he kicked that boy's face off. But, <laughs> no, I, 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 right throughout the game, you talk about pressure and you talk about the nerves. That's probably the only game in my whole career I've, I've got me nerves. Yeah, you looked around the dressing room, I think we spoke before we went out, and how much talent was in there and what we've done and what we've achieved so far. Uh, and the, the backup to that is we didn't win the game or through the game and uh, we, we went in the playoffs. I still fancy this. So for me, there was not. Not a massive amount of pressure. I thought that's obviously they wanted to go on holiday, so uh, it, was, it was good to get the game done in But no, I, I've always said nerves are a good thing. People take it up the wrong way sometimes. Nerves are a good thing. But on that day, none whatsoever, which is strange for me uh, because I'm quite a superstitious and so quite a thinker and a deep thinker. But no, it's it's very difficult to say. It's just another game, but it's not. It's not. And then when you turn around and there's that many fans in one end, uh, it's it's incredible. But for me, it, I took that as a positive, and, and you, you gained energy from that. Uh, I know early early doors, uh, Clayton Johnson went through, and I cut him in half, and I thought I'm going to get in trouble here. Uh, then so he says, Bouncy, uh, people don't think he did, did save it, but he did save it. He took up the ball, it's up to the back, <coughs> and then Billy does what he does, and then this man in the corner does what he does. Uh, so well, I was never in. Any doubt whatsoever that we would we would accomplish what we went to do that day? Mm. Um, we kept to it, saying we got the puck in the corner, didn't we? And uh, we won the game. We talked all week. Talked about it. The puck in the corner is there for us when we go win the game. And that was the mentality when we started the finish. But I think it, the, like when Cops said there, when the latter stages of the season, obviously we, we messed up here against Notts County. Uh, but the last stages of the, of the season, we everybody was scared of us. We had that aura about us that we were going to go into games and. Nine times out of ten, we'd already won. All we had to put the ball in the back of the net and we, we won the game. And that, that's just testament to the, the young players coming through and the older players that were, were nurturing around them. Uh, but it was, like you what, what keep saying, it was a special group. And um, special groups do special things. Rob, thanks for that. Brian, back to you. So let's put ourselves in the manager's mindset now. You've got, you've got the group together, you're heading in to the Brentford game. and. What do you need is a, a colour clash with the kit. You know, our, our home kit is red and white. Our away kit is white and black and white stockings. What are we going to do? So we then have to take the, uh, the extreme step of bringing in the third kit, which we've never played in before, and it was green. <laughs> so, as meticulous as managers are, what sort of preparation uh, did you go into specifically with that? I was talking about it's Sean in time, Sean Lockwood. Uh, he, he just reminded me of the story where it's, it was literally Monday morning when we heard that we had to wear a flag. And they literally got 30 shirts from Nike 
and that was it. What have you got left? We'll have them. <laughs> we'll, we'll have them. We'll put numbers and names on them. Look, colours of the shirts doesn't matter, does it, really? Um, some people are superstitious, but it, it didn't bother us. I was just thinking earlier about the Bournemouth game. We talked about the Bournemouth game. Tommy, it, Tommy and James' husband decided to play two full-backs because they were quite strong on the right-hand side. So I liked playing a full-back in front of a full-back. So defensively, we were really strong. Nothing comes down that side. Tommy, nobody gets down. James, if Tommy goes in front of you, you go, usual things. We worked on it, they knew exactly what to do. What time did you score the winner? Oh, How was that been? <laughs> yeah, it was up here. Last, uh, last couple of minutes, wasn't it? Last minute. Last couple of minutes. And who passed it to him? In the box was Tommy. So, so on Monday morning, in my office, you find the two of you are not getting the box at the same time. You two defensive fullbacks. What are you doing in the box? And that was a, probably one of the, the key, for me, it was the key turning point that game of Bournemouth where we won 1 0. When I knew then that, I knew then that this was special. So, what we're going to do now is we're going to play a graphic up of the, the two team lineups uh, that uh, took the field and play. At uh, uh, Griffin Park that day, we're going to obviously show you the uh, the Brentford lineup, and we'll also show you the the Rovers lineup. And Brian, if you can just um, when we get there, we're just going to uh, just outline the lineup there. So faces have changed over the years. So I'm going to start with number one, Neil Sullivan, because if we remember, once he had been in the uh, in the team for, for most of the season, and his had actually gone out and loan uh, to Wimbledon. So what was you thinking then? Was it Big game mentality, just just going with experience. No, well, John Ryan picked him. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, John Ryan was always on to me. You've got to play Neil Sullivan. You've got to play Neil Sullivan. Gary, Gary, Gary Woods had done really well, but well, not not literally. But when <laughs> I put myself in a hole, you know, I'm digging myself a bit deeper, and I can't get out. Of um, a lot of people think it comes up there. It comes up there. The team played four four two, but in reality, we played four two three one, and the players had a subtle working on in terms of we played obviously a back four: Paul, Rob, Jamie, and Tommy. But we had Jay. Uh, we had um, Dean Furman. A lunch on which John? Where's lunch on that? 12. Yeah, John, sitting in front of the back four. Then the three, we had James, uh, Ian Hume was a number 10, in fact, and David Cottle narrow. They, them three were narrow. So it was a 4 2 3 1 on the, on the, on the night. That's why Brownlee was knackered after 83 minutes. <laughs> he was up there on his own. Where's Lumi? She'll be helping you up here, out with me. But we actually played a 4 2 3 1, which worked perfectly yeah, for us. Um, Uh, John Lundstrom was an important signing. Mm. Young lad from Everton, came in, no fear, wanted the ball all the time, weren't afraid to make mistakes. And uh, I brought two players in at the same time, two young players. One was a young New Zealand international called Cameron Housen, who didn't play a game. And I'd envisaged them playing two games, resting, coming out, playing the games, this, this and that. And that's why I'd worked out with John in the end, played every single game. So he, he, he played a big part as a young player, I must admit that. Can just pass on to Chris for a moment. Chris, obviously he's, Brian's just touched upon the formation there, so basically you're up top. If it comes up there, you've got to try and make it stick, hold it up until you get some support. So how difficult a role is that for you, just playing as a, a lone striker when really you, you need to keep hold of the ball if we can nick one and then we've something to protect and defend? Because I thought we'd be four four two. Yeah, it, it is difficult, but it is a ball that I used to enjoy. Um, I used to go into games knowing that I was up against two centre halves, and I used to enjoy the battle. Um, and I knew how fit Hume he was. I knew how fit Dean Furman was, and I knew they'd be going that way, past us. Yeah. So all I had to do was make it as difficult as possible for, for the centre-halves, whether I win it or not. 
the ball's going to drop two or three yards in front of us, or it's going to go that way, and I knew there'd be runners behind. So it was quite an easy, an easy game for me. But when when Rob said there was no nerves, I was an absolute nervous wreck. No, genuinely, I, I, within two minutes of the game starting, just dry mouth syndrome, just every, everything was just a blur. We, it was probably the strangest game I've ever, ever played in that. I, I can remember the, obviously the goal, but before that, I couldn't tell you what happened. It was, it was bizarre. Well, and Tommy, obviously, um, got away from home, the defence forms a you know, massive part, as does every department of the football team on the day, but you know, your responsibilities, you know, just keeping everything tight, making sure not to concede. You've got Donaldson, you've got Bradley Wright Phillips, you've the trickery of of Harry Forrester as well, for, forging forward. What's how, how are you uh, going through the game? How are you feeling? Same as Rob, really. I, I don't remember feeling. Like, I used to get quite nervous before games, but that that day, I just felt it was going to be our day. Mm -hmm. And leading into it, I'm waiting for kickoff to start. Just, no nerves, just calm, thinking that I know we're good enough to do it. Um, the only thing I did remember feeling was absolutely knackered. <laughs> <laughs> and it felt like the longest because, like you said, when we came back to pre-season, we had like 10 players. I remember playing like 6, 7, 90 minutes in pre-season. And then 50-odd games, I just remember thinking, I, I hope we win because I can't play another three <laughs> games. <laughs> um, but mentally, just literally confident that we were going to do it. It's amazing. And Dave, nervous energy, that's... Nervous energy can inspire you or it can absolutely drain you, can't you? Sometimes you, you can't pick your feet up after 10 minutes because you're so nervous, but other times you know the adrenaline kicks in and you know, it pushes you through in such a, a massive game such as that. Yeah, I think, so man, I, mean, I, I, so I, got, I got injured about February, I think, and came back, and came mm. back on the North County game. So that was great, coming back on and then obviously <laughs> coming on losing that, and then uh, obviously going into this, but... Um, I can remember sort of chatting mostly through the week. There wasn't really a care about winning the league. So you know, I think we said, we just want to get promoted. That's been the aim all along. We don't care whether it's, it's first or second. And the one thing we built that whole season on was being hard to beat. So I think that's a bit where you felt quite confident in the fact. It's not, we don't have to go down there and win 3 0, 4 0, because we built a whole season on basically saying, we're going to defend the two backs of four. You can put the ball in our box for 90 minutes if you want, you're not going to score. And, you know, more often than not, Cox came up with a bit of quality, or put the ball on his end from a corner, and, you know, we won 1 0, and the teams knew <laughs> they weren't going to, you know, couldn't screw them. And so sort of Rob says they were you know, that aura. It's because they knew that they, how hard it was to score against us. So to go down there knowing we didn't actually need to even score, we just needed to do what we've done all season, which would be horrendously hard to beat. And actually being on, on the bench, the so my memory stood up, up until um, you know, the last 10 minutes was it was exactly like Rob said, we, you know, we planned meticulously. The game plan we wanted to play out, it was a very boring away game of football, which is exactly what we aimed. We went down there and said, we're not going to let them have anything, we're going to make it the most boring game in the world, we could draw nil nil, you know, the party, and it was going completely and utterly to God. I say until suddenly, it was only about a couple of headers they were in the box, not even going anywhere. And suddenly, big Jay McCoo's foot comes out of nowhere and <laughs> kicks his head off, and you're like, oh my god, no. Just, I do remember standing on the edge of that box and thinking, three more weeks of training. Yeah. <laughs> we've, we've, we've got a claim which we've all come on to, and you're just going like that, and you're back in, and more or less just saying, what on earth has he just done? You know, and it's... We, we, the game plan had been played out so well, that's mm -hmm. all we talked about all week, and that's where the strength of it, there was no nerves because we knew what we were going to do, and we did it. Barring thirty seconds of uh, everything happened. And James, you look at you look at experience running right away through the through the team, and especially at the, at the back as well. Having Neil Sullivan in there, I remember seeing snippets of highlights taking forever, taking goal kicks, just trying to kill as much time as possible, and, and really just trying to manage the game in the best way possible. So important having somebody like that in between the sticks. I was just going to say that actually. Like looking on that team sheet, the 11 and subs, bar probably Liam Wakefield, you're looking at characters. So every single person there has something about them. Cal Bennett certainly did. Yeah, they've <laughs> either gone on to have a great career um, or had a great career and 
that's, in my opinion, why we were so good. Um, we didn't play the best football, we weren't the most attractive to watch, but we knew how to win games. Um, apart from when we played MK Don's away, which <coughs> was one of the worst I've ever been involved in. Um, but again, you look at that, we go away from home, um, we turn up at the keep mode, the pitch wasn't brilliant at that time. I was speaking to Owen before about the sand, how bad the pitch was, and mm -hmm. people used to turn up and it'd be like, how are we going to play on this? But, but we found a way, we always found a way of winning games, and um, yeah, I think the experience and the character throughout the group uh, shone for me. So, Dana, and I remember, I think it was the, the Orient game, just the turn of the new year, and we, we did everything we could to get the game on, heavily sanded it, there was tractors on it, and the pitch never recovered from then on, and I think that really built a little bit of a, a mentality into us, to, you know, that we were very, very difficult to play against at home. Did that alter the style of football at all because of the pitch? I think so. I think, again, we, we found ways of winning games, um, regardless of who we played against, regardless of what the pitch was like, um, regardless of the weather. Knew how to win games because of the character, because of like Rob said in the beginning, we every single individual had a point to prove. Whether it was to get promoted, was it to more money, whether it was to win the league or um, have a medal around your neck. Um, everybody was fighting in the same direction, and, and that wasn't the case the season before. So it was it was nice to be a part. You could feel it uh, in abundance when you were going into training and when you were playing on a Saturday. You just as a player, when you go out onto a pitch and you're part of a group like this, you know that you're going to win games. You know that regardless of how the game goes, you're going to find a way of winning the match. And it's, it's a weird feeling because in 21 years as being a professional, I've probably been able to count three, three, probably three, three teams that I've been involved in where that's happened, um, which is very rare. And while you've got it, you've got to sort of make the most of it, and we did. Fantastic. Well, what we're going to do now is we're going to um, take you through the footage of that penalty. Of course, the, uh, the lead up to it. We will uh, pause it at some point, but we're going to take it back through time now. So, obviously, we're in the dynamics of the game. Just lump forward. Up you go, Tom. Win it. Donaldson, a great handful, of course. And then. Yeah. So we'll just pause it. Um, there we go. Michael Oliver couldn't wait to give it up. There we go. So Rob, Jamie McComb, what's his boom doing up that high? I always swear. All I can remember from that was a look again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's not, he's not forgiving me this day. Uh, I remember we, we went across the road. Uh, is it the door? Because we had a presentation in. Yeah. And he mourned to my wife for an hour and a half <laughs> that this look that Rob gave him. I'm never ever leave him. <laughs> Rob, I don't know, he had not know what he was doing. He's six foot seven, six foot eight. Uh, he's got feet and arms that go all over the place. <laughs> and he's caught him. But well, yeah, I think he didn't look, but like we have said more many times, and people say it's a cliche, but I still fancy us from that point on. Uh, so he's in goal. Uh, I don't know what Neil said, we've seen it over and over and over again. Uh, one of the coolest guys I've ever run across on a football pitch. Uh, so I still fancied him. I didn't think the boy would score because of what happened in the, in the box when he tried to fight the, the captain. Yeah, it was, it's an interesting one that because the, the, the player who took the penalty in the end was a, a player called Marcello Trotter who was on loan from Fulham at the time and he's wrestling with the regular penalty taker yeah, at the ground. Mm. He fought the ball off each other, uh, which meant so he did what he did and caused chaos and come to the ball and ran back and got on the side for a drink and had a good bag. I still, still fancied us. What I didn't mm. know was where Billy Payton was sat at that present. Well, we're going to come to that. Yeah, we are going to come to that. Chris, from, from your point of view, you, you grafted long and hard right the way throughout the game. You, you're just about over the line and that happens. What, 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 what was your memories of, uh, of that? Exactly what Dave said. You've got another three weeks. You know, you think you've worked that hard. <laughs> Honestly, I yeah. mean, personally, that was what I thought. I thought we, we were that close. Um, you know, it's, it's a penalty kick. It's in his favour. Um, so that was one of the first. I think it was hands on heads. And, I mean, Tommy's face expression there sums, yeah. sums up. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
cancel that holiday. Goodness me. It's quite an unbelievable situation, to, as I say, you know, to battle right the way through, you're away from home, you know, the crowd's all against you, and then for something like that to happen. But that's what happens in football, and what then goes on to happen afterwards is truly remarkable. <laughs> No, it's all right, he doesn't need any attention. What are you saying to the ref there, Rob? Is it principal? <laughs> so it's a mad scramble and it's Paul Quinn who hooks a leg out there. Just the right leg. No, we'll stop it there. Stop it there. Right. So... So hang on a minute, what's, what's, what's going on here? Billy Painter is in anchors of space. I know the reason why he's there. Is somebody going to share that with me? Why is that? Yeah. Go on, Dave. Spill the beans. Well, Flynn will tell a bit more of it, but he was, he was literally on his knees praying to the side of the pitch there. <laughs> <laughs> where, where he was when they probably come across for a drink just after the penalty had been given, and he was literally stood like he's laid there praying on the pitch. He was, he was actually in their half right in front of the Dego. So he said to him, just come in this half, just pray in this half. <laughs> just in case, do you want to get offside? <laughs> the, 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 the thing about obviously the penalty miss, they had all 10 players around the penalty box. So all 10 players were thinking, well, apart from the penalty taker, I might get the rebounds, I'm the hero. They had no men's back. They had a clear run. As soon as the ball was cleared, our first shot, look how close he is to them. My first shot was goal, because I thought he might have gone to the corner flag to yeah. waste time. Yeah. Just run straight to the corner flag and then try to hold in the corner flag. So I don't know. We shot the goal, like, it was like in unison. All of us, Dave Williams, Lee, Lee Butler, we all went, goal, and he went straight for goal. Unfortunately, in this picture, we can't see where James is starting. He's on the edge of the box. That's the quickest he's run. <laughs> since, since, and I won't say that I can't give that secret away. But how he, where he appears from is like phenomenal. So James, I'm gonna we'll, we'll keep it there. So Billy's now. It looks like he's had a little bit of a glance as he got his head up. What are the chances of him passing from there? Very slim. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that, uh, before that, before the penalty was to, um, given, I was, like, as soon as the penalty was given, I was thinking, on the Thursday before we travelled, I went to Toys R Us with my wife, mm. and um, we bought two Samba goals for the kids, and we got to the checkout, we paid for them, and um, she'd only charged us for one Samba goal, so as we were walking off, my wife's gone, they only charged us for one, and I said, well, we're going we're gonna to have to go back and tell them. She was like, nah, don't be stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, we can't, we can't walk out with a samba ball. She went, come on, we'll just go. Anyway, when the penalty got given, straight away I went, I knew I should have paid for that. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God, the first thing that came into my head was that samba ball. Uh, so I was still on the edge of the box thinking, why didn't I just pay for that samba ball? <laughs> and that's the honest, I swear that's the truth. Um, and then the ball's broke, I've turned to really get the ball and uh, then I've just sprinted for my life. I knew they'd only had one, one lad back who was slower than me. <laughs> slower than Brownie. Was it literally just you and Billy then? Was it just literally you and Billy then? It was me, Billy and I think it was the lad that should have took the penalty. Trotter? No, no, it was oh, Trotter. Oh, okay. the captain, yeah. yeah. But, um, but me and Billy had had a, had a set two in training because um, he wouldn't pass, he wouldn't pass me the ball. So when he set off there, I was thinking there's absolutely no chance of getting this. So we'll just we'll just roll on a little bit now. So Billy's It's a lively ball as well, isn't it? It's bobbly. So we'll just stop it there. So it's coming at you. You're on the six yard box. There's nobody really near. Yeah, two's there, but he's out with the washing, that's that's fine. Can you take that back just to see that bobble or <laughs> Listen, I was coming to that. <laughs> so keep us out of the equation, Brian. Yeah, you've got a picture. I mean, 
uh, of all of all the bubbles, and you know, to then have to take a touch, and then basically in the next moment just finish it off. Yeah, I think I just wanted to make sure that it went in. Um, I knew that he wasn't going to get it, and I knew that I could have quite easily missed that. Would you've taken it first time? Um, if it was closer, yeah. Mm. But I, honestly, I knew that. I seen it just sit up in front of me and I thought, there's no way I'm going to get this first time, I'm going to make sure I get it in. Could have ended up being a shinner, couldn't it? Could have ended up being disastrous, really. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't be sat here, put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> so the ball crosses the line. We'll just roll it on from there. Everybody's on the pitch, as you do. They're on the hands and knees, absolutely desolate. You're in there somewhere, and you return without a shirt. There's Brian. Arms go up. <laughs> Fantastic. So in all the euphoria, shirt comes off, goes into the crowd. Bosh. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I just honestly can't remember um, why, I'd, why I'd ever think about doing that is beyond me. I've never thought about taking a shirt off before. Um, but then, yeah, I'm stood there with no shirt thinking, I'm not getting that back. Um, I need a shirt, so... Do you remember getting it back? Yeah, I got it back. Well, yeah. you were wearing it and barely just a lot of love with Sunday night. Or yeah, that quiet night around town. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> the club actually got the lad who got it, um, a replica shirt, and as I was giving him the shirt, he, he literally wouldn't give him my shirt. Back. <laughs> it was like, you know... But it all ended well in the end, didn't it? Because we did yeah, it on Sunday. Benno, Benno gave me a shirt. I went on with Bennett on the back um, for literally two seconds and then that was it. Unbelievable, incredible, incredible scenes. And Chris, you know, for, for somebody of his experience, the, the euphoria of the moment, to just, you don't, literally don't think about what you're doing, do you? You rip the shirt off, you, you're just completely in the moment, aren't you? Yeah, that's it. It was. Uh... I'm sure I took mine off as well. I wasn't even playing. <laughs> I've got a picture with me, me without a shirt. I don't know why. But you did this on the ball that weekend. I think I was looking well. I've been in the gym. Like <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was. Uh, I mean, I remember a picture you got done with the, the, the flare behind. Yeah. And it, it, it is one of the best pictures I've ever seen. It just takes you back to that exact time when you thought, you know. We've just getting promoted in such a massive game under, I mean, just by looking at that, you know, an amazing 20 seconds. And was there any, was there any news filtering through from, from the other games or was that basically kept under wraps? Was it just a matter of concentrating on what we're doing, you know, nothing else matters? Yeah, well, we, we knew that we just needed the point, um, but obviously when, when Cox had stuck it in, we knew then that it was, it was irrelevant, so it was party time. Tommy, obviously you're defending, so you've got a great view of all this. Where, whereabouts were you on the pitch? Where about, what was your view like of, of that incredible 20 seconds or so? I think you referred to that same picture. I think it's one of my favourite pictures from that day. I think Cox is running off and I'm just yeah, sprint, taking off to sprint, sprint up there to celebrate with everyone. Because, like you say, like it's happened once in my career where I've been involved in something like that, a promotion or winning a league and to do it with lads that it would genuine want it with everyone so mm -hmm. it, would, it was special. It was quite a unique episode in, in professional football and um, we're going to show you now what well, other viewers saw it on Soccer Saturday and I, I remember watching this on my phone in a, in a sp sports shop and uh, <laughs> here we go. will be playing in the championship, Doncaster Rovers will be in the playoffs. Goodness me, what nerve the penalty taker will need, Paul Walsh. As Marcello and Schottergeck, who's been on as a substitute, is tightening, there's a few words between two or three players about who was going to take it. Uwe Rossler was pointing out, thinks of Totta, and he's, oh, he's in a crossbar, and he's come down, and come, like, what a, what? Jeff, he's in a fight, he's kept down, bounced about a foot over the line, outside the goal, and now they're up. Painter is breaking away, they're going to score to make it 1-0, they've scored! Computer has made it 1-0 on the other end. I don't believe what I've just witnessed yet. <laughs> 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 oh, from Fulham. 
He's hit the crossbar with a penalty award. It's been a man in four. He's got three in his last four. That penalty would have sent Brentford up. The ball's rebound. And Dortmund have <coughs> gone to the other end. They've scored the goal. They're going up. Uh, and they're going up as champions as well. Because not only uh, have they won or are winning, but Bournemouth, Bournemouth have only drawn in their Bournemouth thought they were champions, but a win for Doncaster not only gives them promotion, he gives them the title as well. Bournemouth up as well. And Brentford, unless there's an astonishing turnaround and they die second, so it's not going to happen, of course. They will have to go into the playoffs. And how will they recover from that mentally, having been within the crossbars width of playing in the championship? Only to find themselves now having to fight their way through the playoffs. Absolutely amazing stuff. James Coppinger is the man who has got the goal. He's thrown his shirt into the crowd. Where is he the first time ever the day? And they won't give it back. <laughs> <laughs> now that's happened once. I don't know whether many people know this. You probably do. But the following weekend, a playoff game between Leicester City and Watford, exactly the same thing happened. Leicester got a a penalty, Anthony Kanoka um, won the penalty, earned the penalty. They had it saved. Watford went at the other end. Troy Deeney scores. Who was the referee? Mr. Michael Oliver, once again. A little bit of symmetry from one week to the next. Quite incredible, but quite incredible stuff, really, then. When you, when you look at that, and obviously, when, from a reporter's point of view, you watch and see what, you know, just unravels basically because it's quite astonishing and obviously then off the back of that there was the, uh, the trophy presentation which we had um, which we had at the, uh, the stadium we had the, the open top bus parade which we're going to take you back to that now look at that 2012 2013 especially the way we did it. You know, um, such a long season and it, it was brilliant. But I just want to say as well that but he, he was just on the screen there. We had uh, Lee Butler, who was mm. our uh, keeper coach. And he's, he's one of the, the best men I've ever met in football. Um, he just, he was the glue, wasn't he? In, in the changing room, everybody absolutely loved him. He, he'd help with a kit. He'd be the first to come and say hello to you on the morning. 
firmest handshake in I've ever, oh, I've ever, yeah, I've ever yeah. met. <laughs> he was just one of the most likable men I've ever met, and I, I think he was practically in tears after after the after the last game. You could see how much it meant to him, how much the lads meant to him, um, and he I think he summed everything up just about the way the ch the changing room was. And it's, it's, it's characters, isn't it, Rob? There's a story about me. Go on. Uh, we, had a, we had a meeting, um, I'm not sure if you remember Brian, but we had a meeting with the commercial side here. Uh, he's not here, I didn't like him, so. Uh, uh, the, 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 I don't like many people. I'm very outspoken, and that's the only person I need an answer. Uh, but it was getting quite heated, but I think, I, I think he wanted us to train in two twos or something. Just for, for, for the sake of it, and I was saying, no, 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 Brian, I said, no, no, no. And then Buzz, who was in the other room, he'd heard, overheard, so he knocked on the door. He said, oh, what's that? Get these guys out of here. And he just walks in, no clothes on whatsoever. <laughs> puts, puts his foot on the table, right from this guy, no clothes on, no clothes on. Uh, John, we've got to go. And the guy was like, yeah, I'm leaving, I'm leaving. And I was like, that's. Brilliant. But the things he did mm. in the round the football club were just, just mental. We just wandering around with no clothes on. We do much. But that's just like Granny said then, he was the one that kept us all going and together. Uh, the day that he left me was a very sad day for us. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, well, we're going to give the opportunity now to uh, everybody who's been good enough to come along uh, this evening. You've obviously got your memories, your thoughts of that fabulous day down in, uh, in West London. So we're going to throw the floor open to questions now. If you would like to uh, ask any questions, it doesn't matter if you think you've heard uh, the answer already tonight, but uh, that's what we'd like you to do, is uh, ask some questions tonight. Good evening, sir. Your name and who's your question for? Yeah, my name's Dave. Um, I'm going to ask two questions, I'm going to, I'm going to ask three. Um, <laughs> right, one is, one is, I know you're all, it's like Dad's army, but do you fancy coming back? <laughs> uh, the other ones are, um, it's been touched on before tonight, but what were all your views, uh, all your thoughts, when that penalty were given? And uh, I'd like to ask James, were you, were you clapping yourself when, when, when you put that ball in? Um, I didn't really have time to think about it, to be honest. Like you say, it, was, uh, it happened that quick. Uh, but we. We travelled in, us three, and Jamie McComb, James husband, we all travelled in a Kia Sedona. So we bought like a minibus. And oh, really? I was, I was in that as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We all got that long way. Tommy, did we pick you up? Sometimes. Yeah, because uh, clapped out Kia Sedona. Um, and when they give the penalty straight away, apart from the Samba goal, I was stood there thinking, oh my god, we're going to have to travel in the city for another three weeks. We had no air conditioning. Um, yeah, we used to have to pour water into the radiator, it used to overheat. We'd be sat on the hard shoulder of the motorway, um, waiting for it to cool down. So, yeah, that was one of my overriding thoughts um, when the penalty was given. But I didn't really have a chance to think about it. It happened that quickly that, again, I just sort of had to put it in, and yeah, the rest is history. Excellent stuff, and um, when, when he said can you all come back, that's not detrimental to the current playing staff by the way, because we, we are actually doing alright, so <laughs> just wanted to put that up. Okay, do we have a, oh, good evening sir, what's your name and who's your question for? It's Les, it's for Brian and Rob jointly, um, being such an important match at the end of the season, did you have any differences on what the first 11 would be, and who would be on the bench as well? Yeah, I think the, uh, the team was almost certainly going to be what it was, uh, there's no doubt that, I mean, David had just, David had just come back from injury, um, there was nobody, well, I think a key to successful season is also what the impact the substitutes can make as well, so I think what you pick on the substitute bench is important, uh, and we had a strong substitute bench, saying that, um, I remember distinctly in the 83rd minute, when Brownie was flagging a little bit, and Lee Butler said, after about 80 minutes, Lee Butler said, Brownie's struggling. So I said, what are you sure? I looked at Brownie and Brown. I'm not, I'm not doing anything. Literally. He came, I took him off, he came over, he gave me an almighty bullet <laughs> Rob was screaming and shouting, I said, what are you doing? What are you doing? <coughs> 
they're probably struggling. All right, just get on with it. And, uh, but substitutes need to, needed to make an impact, and they, they did most of the season. The team picked itself. The back four was like as it is. Um, it was everything you wanted from a back four. As I said, John picked the goalkeeper. <laughs> so that was already done. <laughs> uh, in terms of Dean and John, and John, they were they were settled. David Cottle was producing everything. James on the on the left hand side coming in on his right foot. And Ian Hume was effervescent. He'd run about all over the place. It would be really impressive and at the last minute, at the final point, sometimes he would lay it down. This was what every team needs, is that perfect centre forward who is unselfish and does everything for the others and doesn't get the acclaim that he richly deserves really. Um, but uh, the team was nailed on, even after the Notts County game, he was nailed on that was going to be the team. Excellent stuff, thank you very much for that answer Brian. Do we have uh, any more questions uh, that we're all bursting to ask? Okay, just going to... Um, my way around here. You put the hand up first there. Either or. Good evening, sir. What's your name and who's your question for? And it's for Rob and Brian, basically. We had a fantastic season, great game, but obviously you both lost your jobs. How did you feel about that? that uh, I will concentrate on the, on the playing side. Uh, <laughs> How about you, Brian? Well, yeah, yeah it's, it's... Yeah, we've got to be careful, because things are happening in the past. There's no, no way I was better. Um, with 10 games to go, we were handily placed, and uh, spoke with John Ryan, he said, minimum playoffs. If you want your chance of managing this club next year, minimum playoffs. Five games to go, promotion. <laughs> These, th that's the rules. Friday night in the Hilton Neon Hotel, was it? Perfect hotel, just outside. Hilton Neon, he calls me at uh, Abba State after your meal, I need a meeting with you, Brian. Nine o'clock meeting. Champions, otherwise you're finished. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, John. I'll be okay. And without being controversial, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to water it down. No. We, <laughs> 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 you're old friends. <laughs> Good uh, Saturday night was fantastic. Um, I can't remember much about Saturday night. I did stay in the crowd in Bawdry. Uh, Desi, my mind that was up there, looked after me and finished me off with a gallon of whiskey. <laughs> and um, Sunday was obviously the Play of the Year Awards, which was fantastic. Monday was the uh, going around the town in the open top bus. Tuesday I received a call from the club and I won't name names. Do you want to apply for the manager's job? That's how it happened. So that's, uh, that was the situation. I won't take it any further because that's a little bit, uh, what have you. Uh, but uh, who's now jobs? Look, football's, yeah. there is no common sense in football. None was, especially in management. You deserve, just, you deserve the crack if you're going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think, I think, I think just, just, just add one little thing to that. I knew the Paul Dickhoff was given the job with five games to go. I knew it. In football, the world, you get to know these things. I knew that he'd been offered the job. There was one other person involved who possibly could have uh, had the job, but I know Paul Dickhoff has given the job. Not offered it, given the job with five games to go. Football. But can't take that away from me.
It's one for Rob. Um, Dean Saunders once said on talk radio, <laughs> he, he, he didn't have to sort any of the Doncaster Rovers players out because Rob Jones had given him a clip before he had to. <laughs> Have you ever done any, give a clip to any of these lads that you sat with today? I've never hit any of these boys in this dressing room. This dressing room. No, we didn't need to. Didn't need to. We, we, I think we had a massive mutual respect between all of us, didn't we? So, um, sometimes it just took the look. Whoever made the look, it just took the look. Because we all knew, and we were all honest, and we all wanted the same thing, and we all wanted to go in the same direction. Uh, it affects it when you have, a, you have what we call a bad egg in a dressing room, but we didn't have any of that here. Uh, we had a dressing room that was, was magnificent, it was together from the very beginning right to the very end. Uh, a shame that the, the dressing room was uh, was broken up at the end of the season, because I still believe if, if these two was in that, in that dressing room this, the, the, the following year, the last game of the season, we would never go down. Uh, and I, I, talk, I, I believe that. Uh, it was taken to pieces. The team had just won the league. Best away record in the country. It got taken to pieces. And to this day, I still can't understand it. But again, like Brian said, that's football. Uh, people have different opinions, different, people have different ways of doing things. But yeah, no, I didn't hit any of these boys. No. <laughs> I think um, what I will say, you know, from a player's point of view, I was going out on the pitch knowing that Rob, especially being captain, had trust in us. And I think he knew who needed a, a telling off. And I think he knew who just needed to be left alone and hopefully they'll come good in the end. And I think that balance, you got it spot on, Rob, I think. And that kind of got us, got us there. And that's, from a player's point of view, it's a massive, it's a massive thing. I remember uh, the Stevens game when me and Brian were in our first interim in church. And obviously Brian used to support spoke right earlier. But we spoke, spoke about a minute before he got off with me in the half hour. And he hadn't been playing, and he'd been left out in, in, the, in, the, in the call by, by Dean. Uh, they didn't see eye to eye. Uh, but we, we spoke, and uh, I think that's probably the best, play, best game you would have played from then on. He was, he was unbelievable, he was unplayable. Uh, and from then on, he just in, in, encapsulated what we were all about. And he knew that, like you just said, that we all had to take each other's back. And we all knew that. If, Push come to show, but there was a fight going on. I got 10 minutes behind me, now one in the fight with me, rather than one or two, and people went in different directions. And that, that makes it means an awful lot of football club and an adjustment. That you, you've got, you've got, sorry, you've got players who love what you're doing and are passionate about you rather than what you can give them. And uh, I, still, you, you cannot speak highly enough of, of the boys in that dressing room that year. And uh, who knows what happened in the year after. Don't really, not expecting it, can we? But uh, no, that that game, that week, that month, that year, will live with us for the rest of our lives and show you the rest of your lives because it was it was special. Okay, well, not too far to go. What's your name, sir? Who's your question for? My name's Ben. And a question for everyone, really. After the Steve Leeds away game when Bob scored in stoppage time, between two one. All the players were in front of the fans singing the Rob Jones song. And I've never ever seen a moment of team spirit come round like that ever before. What was that like to be involved with? I mean, I think, like I said, around that time, um, it just felt like everything was going to go our way. Just like the cops had come back in that game. Um, come on, come on. Man. Came on, and just you could see the difference. You know, like we said, through the season we were, and I'm sure you guys were sitting there at times, you know, the way Saunders had us playing initially was so regimented and we were so hard to beat, but obviously sometimes it didn't translate to, to great free-flowing football to watch. And then I remember in that game, we were going that way and seeing Cops, just bits of quality when he came on that you know, just can actually, that, that little bit of quality that unlocks something that like, him, him and Cops had. But that doesn't normally translate to always you know, going your way. So you know you need that bit of luck in those seasons and to get the goal in the last minute. Of course it was him. I think he got about eight goals that season at least. No. Uh, and you know it just get it right. Man. <laughs> <laughs> it was just going your way, and it just felt at that time that you know no matter what happens, someone's going to be on the end of it. Someone's going to someone's going to step up each game and do do what was needed and. 
Like it's, it's an amazing feeling to have on a football pitch because it can feel very lonely when you when you don't feel like you know, the players around you are backing you and vice versa. So when, when you're feeling that you know everyone on that pitch is all together, it's really easy. It's an amazing feeling. Excellent. Thanks very much for that, David. Uh, do we have any more uh, questions from the floor? We've got a, yeah, a young man here. Hello. What's your name and who's your question for? Uh, I'm a winner and I want to ask cops. Do you think this could ever happen again in the future? Wow. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. Yeah, definitely. Uh, no, I think, I think the, the squad and the team that we've got now is, is really good. Um, and we're building... Um, and we're working really hard every day to, to achieve something like this. I mean, it comes very rarely, like I said, three, probably three or four teams that I've had or been involved in in 21 years. Um, and, I, and I see the same traits in the squad and the team that, that I'm involved in right now. Um, but you, you share a special bond with, with players like this. So I haven't seen Tommy for four, five, six years. Um, see Brownlee every now and again. Um, Rob, I've seen for a while, and Dave's the same. But as soon as, as soon as I see him, like I have this feeling that you know, like that I've I've been with him all all week and all day. And um, when you've got that, you know that, that it's special. And, and I do have that with the group that I've got now. And, and I hope that we can go on and, and achieve something this season. Um, we're giving ourselves the best opportunity. But um, yeah, it's it's very rare that you you form a, a special group like we did. Excellent, good question as well. Uh, do we have uh, any more uh, questions? This young man here, what's your name? Who's your question for? Uh, it's Owen, it's for Tommy. Um, we're trying to ask how your shoulders are after all those long throws that season. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the only reason I got a move to Blackburn, because that's the only reason I got to Simon. Um, yeah, I think it did a little bit of damage, to be fair. Um, but I say we'd, we'd found, find ways to to win games and if it meant throwing it long to Rob Brownie, Jim McCoom, then whatever works. <laughs> the ball could go out of play <coughs> five yards in our own half and I'd just sprint down the line knowing that he's going to pick the ball up and launch it 150 yards. And it would get reaches every time, wouldn't it? I'd, just, I'd receive the ball near enough at their corner flag, and I just sprint. No, like, Tommy will find it's not bad. <laughs> what a great weapon to have as well. I mean, it's not the first, it won't be the last who have used such a, a strong weapon like that. Obviously, we go back to Stoke and Rory Gillap and, and many. many great, aren't they? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> you were very good at it, let's put it that way. Very, very good at it. Good question. And uh, final couple of questions. Hello, hello, what's your name? Uh, Daniel. Which question for? Uh, everyone, really. Uh, what were you thinking the day after the game? <laughs> <laughs> I'm never going to feel as bad as this ever again. The day after. Oh, the day after. The day after the night before. Good God. Uh, we got the bus, didn't we, on the way back? And we were going to go to the, the pub on the corner, but the policeman said, don't go in there. Please don't go in there. <laughs> so we stopped about a half mile away, off license, didn't we? I jumped off. I decimated the off-license. Uh, we got back in the bus and we drove home, and then we got doffed off in town. Uh, not a lot I remember after that. <laughs> I did buy, oh no, I did buy six pink cowboy hats. <laughs> I, saw, I saw the video the other day, and I was like, no, I don't know what did. So I'm going around with a pink cowboy hat. I think then we all had one on. And then uh, I woke up next morning, next to you in bed in the ground. <laughs> I did, I did, I did, I did, I did. Yeah. <laughs> the guy in the corner did, but he did. <laughs> uh, and then we had to try and get home to him. We got the Kia. Oh. This, this Kia is the reason we were the league, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. The atmosphere in this Kia was unbelievable. We bought up Billy Painter. Oh, Billy Painter, feel good. <laughs> we bought up Billy uh, as, a, as a collective group. Uh, he said, nah. I said, yeah, it's got tax on it. Yeah, 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 that's, 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 that's. She went, yeah, 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 wait, she did it yesterday. It's, it's got a year on it. All right. Six months later, we're on the hard show on the A1, we're me. I'm looking at the dashboard. <laughs> and I said, uh, cops, just have a look in there, see what the MOT is. This is, I might need to do it. He went, there isn't one, no. 
So, around Billy. Yeah, there is, Rob, there is. <laughs> yes. I said, Billy, when did you run out? He went, the day after I sold you it. <laughs> <laughs> so, we've been driving around for six months in this Kia. Uh, but it was brilliant because Billy had it before us, and Billy took all the seats out. And he put <clears> maps <throat> in the back, and he put curtains up beside him. <laughs> and there's a, uh, on the A1, where there's two petrol stations together across the road. He used to drive from Warrington on the morning, leave at six, get there for half seven, have an hour in the Kia, then drive in the train. <laughs> so that's what he did, didn't he? Yeah. And then uh, it comes service to requirements, so he tried to offload it to us and we, we bought it, uh, as we do. But uh, it, was, it was brilliant, and we still had the, the, the following year when Ross Turnbull turned up. So Ross Turnbull. I just won the Champions League. <laughs> <laughs> we picked him up one morning from, the, from near where me and Cops live, and uh, he said, uh, Are you wearing this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, what's wrong? No, 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 I'll go in my car. No, no, you have to get there. Get there, you'll buy the coffees, and then someone gets the sweets, and someone gets the tissues, and away we And that's how it was. Uh, it was 50 quid every month, wasn't it? Each, but petrol, wasn't it? It was brilliant. Uh, and then day two, Ross used to drive it every day. He's Ross Turnbull, the Champions League winner. You should drive this crap duck here. <laughs> it's a big brownie up from the train station. Uh, Tommy every now and again. Johnny Maxted used to roll in the boot, didn't he? Yeah. Uh, it was just, it was just brilliant. Sunday mornings was to come in and put smooth radio on, and then me and Ben and would be singing away at smooth radio. The kit lads in the back didn't have a clue to talk about. Uh, but you know, that was great. It just, it. Oh, there's a story. Oh my God. I don't need to tell that one because I got angry, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> wow, what do you need this one? <laughs> Picked up a rich hiker at Ferry Bridge Services. Yeah, I felt sorry for him. Um, he looked all lonely and by himself, so we managed to get him in the care. And <laughs> he offered us um, some spliffs. <laughs> and uh, Rob was driving and. Uh, whoa, 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 fella. <laughs> Not in here. Um, so yeah, everybody got out and we took him, we dropped him off near Teesside, didn't we? He had him in a book. He had them encyclop got an encyclopedia out and they're all chased into this encyclopedia. Um, so that was the last time we picked up a hitchhiker. <laughs> I think the question was about the night actually, we got off a bit tangent now with the old key and um... <laughs> the, 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 the night looked after itself, I think we probably met mostly when we were out. Uh, Kyle Bennett was ripping everybody's clothes, wasn't he? Wasn't he? Like Kyle's Kyle does, he's a lunatic. Uh, Adam, Adam Smith lost his glasses, he didn't lose them though, did he? I found out later. Butch took them off him and stood in them. <laughs> on purpose, on purpose. So Adam Smith, who was our analyst, was magnificent, he's now a Wigan. He's head of it and said, what, really? So he lost his glasses, what, but nicked them and stood them. Then he lost his phone. Then his wife threatened to divorce him because he knew where he was. Uh, he woke up in the next room to us at the ground. <laughs> okay, so uh, there's some stories we can tell you from that night. There's some stories we can uh, No, let's just say it was eventful. Just after the, um, after the celebrations, this is immediately after the game. Um, we've all kind of filtered through with the changing rooms. And I think I was one of the last with Neil Sullivan. And just as I'm about to walk in, obviously there was champagne, there was Budweiser's, the analyst was getting thrown into an ice bath. <laughs> it was just great fun. Um, there was two drug testers that stood at the door. I said, Mr. Brown, Mr. Sullivan, can you come with me, please? So we had to go upstairs and just missed all of the celebrations. And I don't know, well, the lads will tell you, it's, it's hard to go up to the toilet after, after a game, so we were up there for ages, and me and Neil, were just, it was like we just got relegated in a way, we were just sat there like, oh, we almost hear them in like, having so much fun. <laughs> and then um, Sully's just tapped us and went, they could be worse, and their two centre-halves were sat on the other side of the room, and I was like, ah. And you like my lads. Wow. <laughs> Fantastic insight. And uh, final couple of questions. We do have any young man down at the front. No need to look so worried, but shall I? My name's Toby. My question's for Cops. If you could pick any player from the 2012-13 squad and put it into our Cubbon Donny squad, who would it be? Oh. <laughs> I 
don't even have to think about it, uh, Rob. Um, I think, I think again, like I said it right at the beginning, that he's doing himself an injustice, but they're few and far between people like Rob. Um, leaders on the pitch, off the pitch, and although we had a special group for me, he stood out uh, head and shoulders above everybody, and that's, that's not doing anybody an injustice or um, been harsh on anybody else. I just, I just felt like um, we could do with, with a Robin in anybody's team. Um, so yeah, it'd be Rob Jones. Well done, James. Good answer. Well, well negotiated there. <laughs> Excellent. Guys, just stay with us because we are coming to the end of what I hope has certainly been an enjoyable uh, evening so far tonight. And, you know, we do, we do want to keep it upbeat. We want to keep it realistic as well. As you probably noticed, the t shirt over there in the uh, corner. Well, November is Pancreatic Cancer Awareness Month. The <coughs> have teamed up with SVM Global to raise funds for Pancreatic Cancer UK with our limited edition signed t-shirts. You can learn more about this charity and why it is so important to us in the video that we are going to show in a few moments time. And buy the t-shirt at the Club Doncaster box office for just £12. T-shirts can be purchased in person at the box office or online. You can also register your interest for those tonight. We are just going to show you a quick video though on the screen right now. Well, I've been supporting Rovers since sort of the late 1960s and since I lost my wife earlier this year Rovers have been so supportive um, they've been absolutely brilliant and Rovers is one of the main things that gets me through what I've been going through when my wife was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in 2017 it was a devastating blow as you can imagine Gavin Baldwin was one of the first people to approach me and said, come have a chat, come and have a coffee. And that meant a lot to me. And when she passed away earlier this year, the club has been so supportive to me over the past six months. It's been incredible. It really, really has. And it makes me feel like I'm a member of the family, if you like. Um, Doncaster Rovers, yeah, you could say it's a small, unfashionable club, but it's, it's a community club. It helps people, it goes out into the community, it supports its fans. And when we hear the uh, Rovers family, I think every supporter is part of that family. There are another couple of people that I know that have uh, associated with the club that have had experience with uh, loved ones passing away through pancreatic cancer. I mean, Paul Mayfield's mum and dad, uh, they passed away through it. And I think Sean Lockwood's dad has passed away from it. And so it's, it's important to me. Pancreatic cancer research only gets, I think it's less than 2% of the cancer budget for the whole country. I mean, 27 people are diagnosed with this every day. And the only real cure for it is surgery. And I think only 10% are eligible for surgery. And the life expectancy for people that are diagnosed with pancreatic cancer is, it, it, it's, it hasn't improved since the 1970s. And I think it's important that government, uh, charities, we've got to find this early test. We've just, we've just got to do it. Uh, it'll save so many lives and it'll stop people suffering what I've been through. Pancreatic cancer, it's a killer and I can testify to that. So my dad was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer um, the day before Len South's wife's funeral. Uh, in early May. Um, devastating disease. Uh, early in March we had no signs, no symptoms that he was ill uh, and yet four months later in September he passed away. Um, when Len asked us if we could work with Pancreatic Cancer UK 
um, to raise money for the charity. It was it was something that felt that right to do. Uh, Len's obviously a great supporter of the club, uh, and from a personal perspective, it also felt something that needed to be done uh, and something that I wanted to get involved in as well. The problem with the disease is that the symptoms go hidden for so long, so once often the symptoms present, it's actually too late to do much about it. Um, and what we need to try and do is, is raise funds so we can do early tests and early identification, uh, which will hopefully save lives in the future. So we've teamed up with Pancreatic Cancer UK uh, and with the support of one of our partners, SVM Global, um, decided to, to create some t-shirts with the Pancreatic Cancer UK logo on and get them signed by the first team. Um, we're then going to have these in sale um, from the club shop, uh, from the box office, uh, and all profits from the shirts will, will go to Pancreatic Cancer UK. And hopefully we can do something that will um, prevent others suffering in the same way. Um, we know some of our supporters and obviously some of our family members have, have done in the past, but we can do something positive. So we saw Sean Lockwood uh, there on, on the video. I've got Len South uh, with us as well, the chairman of the uh, Supporters Club. has very kindly come up uh, to say a few words. A very, very difficult time. It's, it's, it's an absolutely horrible disease. I'm sure lots of people within this room have been touched by some form of cancer as well. And uh, sadly, you lost, your, you lost your good lady to, uh, you know, to this despicable, non-discriminatory disease. And it'd be just nice to raise some awareness, wouldn't it? And, uh, and try and raise a few bob as well. Yeah. Absolutely. We need to get this early test and it's important that we try and raise as much money as we possibly can. And all I would say is go buy the t-shirts, raise a few bob and let's see if we can get this early test sorted out. Len, thank you very much indeed. You must have been very very good at that Well, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, brings our evening to a close. Once again, if you do want to uh, purchase a T-shirt tonight, signed up by the first team, you can do so. It's been held up there. You can see it on the mannequin as well. But I've got to say, it's been very, very enjoyable. It's been an absolute honour for me to host such a great evening. Your applause, please, for Tommy Spur. <laughs> to Brian Flynn. <laughs> to Chris Brown. Rob Jones, David Tyers, and to James Gottman here. Thanks again.